So here we are in the book of Ezra, so excited about this passage tonight, really about the whole book and what God is doing. So let's begin with prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the worship tonight. First of all, there is that supernatural work that you do when your people gather together in person. Uh, even the psalmist says it in so many places. Another one is, you know, behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together. In unity, there's, there's this togetherness, there's this koinonia, there's this fellowship, this supernatural work that happens when the temple of God gets together because we are the temple of God, the temple of the spirit. And, and we're joining together with brothers and sisters in Christ. And wow, it's great. It's so good. So thank you for the time of worship. Now we do pray you'd speak to us as we're looking at this passage. Really, we're on our journey through the word of God. But what a great place to end up at such a time as this. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. We all say... Amen. And this is one of the amazing things that I find about us here in the book of Ezra. You know, we began our journey going through the entire Old Testament on Wednesday nights in Genesis about four years ago. And only the Lord could line it up that we started the book of Ezra last week in the homecoming, right? As we began meeting physically again, once again. And here we are, and we're going to be looking at it tonight. We'll be looking at the book of Nehemiah that talks about them coming back into the land. And so we're coming back into the land, and it's exciting. It might be scary for some, and yet God has lessons for us. So here we are in chapter 6, and, and really this whole passage, these latter chapters, really talk about God's faithfulness. God is so faithful. You know that, right? In Deuteronomy 7, 8, God says this, Therefore know that the Lord, he is your God, and he's a faithful God, and I keep mercy and a covenant with you for thousands of generations. I have found in my life that God is so faithful. In fact, the Bible tells us that God won't leave us. He won't forsake us. He is reliable. He's trustworthy. He can always be counted on. What God says he does. God is not 99% faithful. He is 100% faithful. What he promises, he always performs. He doesn't forget. He doesn't falter. He doesn't change. He doesn't disappoint. He does it all. And that's what we find in the book of Ezra. Why is this significant? Well, in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah, came in decimated the whole territory, destroyed the walls of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, brought it down to nothing, took all of the treasures, carried them away to Babylon, as well as the people, those that weren't killed. And yet God told them through the prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 29 and verse 10, thus says the Lord, after 70 years of captivity, I will bring you back into the land and I will cause you to return to this place. And so this is what we saw in the first five chapters of Ezra. Uh, it was actually under the leadership of Zerubbabel that he brought back 50,000 of the Jews from Babylon, allowed to go, given permission to go back into the land. And here's the thing, though. As soon as the people came to the land, when God's people say, let's arise and work, Satan comes to oppose, right? And we saw that. And so the foundation of the temple was complete. They laid the foundation. But as soon as they did that, all the people that lived in the area, in the territory, all these pagan peoples, they became upset. And they wanted to attack them and get after them, you know. And when you stand up to walk with Jesus, I was talking to a brother just before the service. He's been walking with the Lord, I think, four years, I think it was. And he says, man, it's the greatest of times, but also a lot of opposition. That's what happens when you start to serve the Lord. So when they came back in the land, first of all, the enemy sought infiltration. So the people of the land came up to Zerubbabel and said, hey, we'd like to build with you. Let us help you. And Zerubbabel wisely said, no, you cannot. Only the Jews, only God's people will build this temple in this city. He knew that if they interacted with the people, they might intermarry with the people and fall back into idolatry. By the way, we're going to see tonight that they actually did that, unfortunately. But at first, Zerubbabel said, no way, we're not going to let that happen. And then what happened after that was irritation. They, when that didn't work, they sought to constantly stop and thwart the work. They came up with all kinds of zoning ordinances, building permits, and building code compliances, trying to stop and stop and stall the work. But they kept on going, kept on going. And then when that didn't work, they, they tried all-out intimidation. 
They said, the people said, we're going to send letters back to the king of Persia for where you came. And we're going to tell him that you guys are just a bunch of evil people. And you know what? The work did come to a stop, to a stop for a while, for about 15 years. But then, as we saw in our last study, God raised up two powerful prophets. They were the prophet Haggai and the prophet Zechariah. And they came along. The people said, no, you need to get to work. Don't listen to the world. You don't have to listen to their commandments. You do what God has told you to do. And they began to build. And again, it was completed, the, the foundation. They were excited. But as they started to go back to work, we know that the governor in that territory sent letters, said, we're going to go back to Persia. We're going to try and stop this work. And Zerubbabel said, you do that. <clears throat> you send a letter to the king over there. And you tell him, let a search be done that in days of old, Cyrus made a decree. And by the way, Cyrus was a, a Persian. And the Medo-Persian law was, once you establish a law, it cannot be annulled. So check your records, and you will see that he actually gave an edict for us to come back into the territory and build the temple. And so that's where we left off in chapter 5. That's kind of our backdrop. And now we're picking up in chapter 6. There's a new king in the land. He's received this letter, and his name is Darius. And Darius made a decree. And he searched in the archives. And verse 2, a scroll was found. And this is what they found. Verse 3, in the first year, King Cyrus, he actually made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt. And in fact, verse 4, it says, let the expenses be paid from the king's treasury. So they found out, yeah, not only did the king decree that it should be built, but we'll finance the whole thing. And I just want you to see God's faithfulness. Isn't God faithful? God will do what he says, and he'll blow your mind when he does it. So he says, yeah, I'm bringing you back. And by the way, I'll have these, pa these pagan people. They'll pay for the whole thing. They'd been in captivity for 70 years. God brought them back. And you know what? You might be or sense or feel like you're in a wilderness right now. You've been in captivity. Maybe some of you feeling that way shut in, right? What, what's God going to do? But God always has a plan. He is always faithful. Now, therefore, so this letter now comes back from Persia under the new king, Darius. And he says, Tatani in verse 6. That was the governor of all these uh, pagan uh, nations around the Israelites. Keep yourselves far from the Jews, he says. Verse 7. Let the work of the house of God alone. Moreover, I'm issuing a decree that what you should do for them, let the cost be paid at the king's expense from the taxes on that side of the river. So here's what I want you to do. Stay away from them. Let them build their house. And not only that, all the taxes you collect in the area, I want you to give it to them and let them do the work. Isn't that cool? I love it. Now, <clears throat> beyond that, in verses 9 through 10, he tells them to provide the animal sacrifices for them. And then he says this in verse 11, whoever alters this edict, let a timber be pulled from his house and erected and let him be hung on it. In other words, if anybody tries to come against them, they'll be put to death. And may the God who causes his name to dwell there destroy any king or people who put their hand to alter it or destroy the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, give this decree. So guess what? The people went back to work. Only the foundation had been laid up to this point. And uh, check out verse 15, the temple was finished. So we don't have all the details of how long it took, but quickly the people completed the temple. And verse 16 says, they celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. And the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first of the month. And so here you have this great celebration going on in verses 20 through 22. So this was a great moment. They'd gone back. They finished the building of the temple. The temple was rebuilt. Now, just a couple of things I want to highlight. I guess the, the most important one would be in verse 21. Notice he says, as they were celebrating the Passover and celebrating, he said, separate yourselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. I just bring that out because I think that's a good word for us. I think we always need to hear that. We need to be exhorted because, man, there's a lot of filth around us, right? There's a lot of temptation around us, a lot of things that don't necessarily look filthy in themselves, but they would defile us as God's people. Yeah. 
And in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, God says, come out from among the people and be separate, says the Lord, that I might receive you. We want God's blessing. And God says, I'll receive you, but you need to clean yourself up. Get yourself from the world. In 1 John 2, 15, it says, don't love the world or the things in the world. And to be honest, a lot of times we really do love it, right? I mean, there's a lot of cool things, a lot of neat things, and there's nothing wrong with having possessions or living in a home, all those things, but those things can't control us, guide us, or direct us. So this was a good word for them. Now, let's come to chapter seven. It says, after these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, now king of Persia, and so now we now move, we've moved up to about 458 BC, and uh, it's at this time, notice, Ezra. So now we're introduced to Ezra really for the very first time in this book. And Ezra, and it has, of course, his whole genealogy here in verse five. I'm not gonna read it all. But it says in verse six, this is that Ezra that came up from Babylon. And he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all of his requests according to the hand of the Lord of God upon him. And in verse seven, you have a list of men who came with him. So now this is kind of like the second half of the book. You have, this is the second return to, to Jerusalem, to Israel. The first took place earlier in 580 or 536 BC. Again, that was Zerubbabel. We talked about that. But this is now the second wave of people returning to the land, actually 70 years later under Ezra. So a good amount of time has passed. And as we mentioned, when we first began this book, there will be a third return to the land. That's 444 BC, and that's the next book we look at. That's Nehemiah. He comes later with another group of people. But a few things about Ezra, and he's the one, of course, who wrote this book. It tells us here in verse 6 that he was a skilled scribe. So that tells us he was one who wrote the word of God, you know, rewrote it as it was given from the Pentateuch, from Moses and so forth. And he taught the scripture. So this is a man who knew the word of God. And then secondly, it tells us that the hand of the Lord was upon him. So that when you saw the, this guy, Ezra, you knew, wow, the hand of the Lord's on that guy. Wouldn't you love that to be said of you? Yeah. I mean, the, the hand of the Lord is upon that gal. Man, I could, see, I could see God working in their life. And you know, suffice to say, we've probably said that about individuals. We might not have said the hand of the Lord is upon them, but we might say, wow, I could see God really working in their life. What, what a neat thing to be said. And, and that's how we want to live in such a way that we just, we're with Jesus so much that Jesus kind of comes out. He just kind of leaks out, you know. Don't you remember the first time after you were walking with the Lord? I remember the first time I, I, I'd just been saved maybe a couple weeks and all of a sudden I started talking Christianese, you know. I remember being in the workplace and got excited about something. I went, praise the Lord. And people went, what did you say? I don't know. Praise the Lord. You know, because I was around God's people. I was just excited about what God was doing in my life. And, you know, the more you spend time with Jesus, the more people see Jesus on you. So that's what they saw. This was a man of God. God was on him. Now, verse 8, Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. So this is about 558 B.C. And this is what I love is verse 10. For Ezra, so he came with the people in the second wave. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach the statutes and ordinances in Israel. Man, there are three great truths that I believe God wants us all to be part of and all about. First, he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. Here was a man who said, I, I'm committed to God's word. Here's, I, I want to know God. Suffice to say, that's all of you, or you wouldn't even be here tonight, right? I, I think of Psalm 11997 that says this, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. He just, oh, I just want to know more about the Lord. That, that, was, that was Ezra. He sought the Lord of the Lord. But the second thing is, oh, so important. It's not enough just to seek the Lord or to read the scriptures. He actually wanted to do them, right? <laughs> That's the most important. He sought to do it. So many times, and many Christians make the mistake of, well, I read the word of God, I, or I listen to the word of God, I go to church. Yeah, but the most important thing is doing it, right? Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't, don't do what I say? Or James, right, tells us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, because if we only hear it and don't do it, we're deceiving ourselves. 
So Ezra sought the word of God. He sought to live out the word of God. And then finally, he taught the word of God. He taught the statutes and ordinances in Israel. Now, again, he had this calling of God to do that. But in one sense, we're all teachers. Did you know that? We're all teachers of God's word. Yeah, someone put it this way. We teach the word of God each and every day by the actions we perform and the words that we say. People believe what they see, whether it's the truth or a bust. So how do people see God's word as they look at us? <laughs> That's a good word, right? What do they see? Is it genuine or is that hypocritical? Now, moving on, verse 11. This is the copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra, you know, as he was about to, you know, go to the land. And here you have this letter and its details, and it's found there in your Bibles, verses uh, 12 to 26. And I'm not going to read it all, but I just want to highlight a few things. That first of all, as Ezra is coming now to Jerusalem, he has the king's authorization. Verse 13, I issue a decree, says Artaxerxes. So he had an official mandate. He, he, God is the one in control, and he moved the heart of the king to move Ezra. So that's, that's cool, cool to know. God can move the heart of a king, the Bible says, like a water course. Number two, he was given compensation. In verse 15, it tells us he was given silver and gold by others to take with him to Jerusalem. So he has all this money that he's taken with him to provide for the temple. And by the way, uh, you can add to that, he's given an open budget. In other words, if all the money wasn't enough that he took with him, verse 20 says, the king says to him, hey, whatever more is needed for the house of God, which you may have occasion to provide, pay for it from a king's treasury. Hey, just charge it to my account. Wouldn't you like to have that? Well, you know, we would like to put this nice uh, candle. No problem. Just ch charge it, you know. And, uh, and then on top of that, we'd love this too. Tax exemption. That's kind of cool. Look at verse 24. And it will also be unlawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom to any of the people. So Artaxerxes gives, man, this, this carte blanche blessing from God to Ezra. What? That's so cool. And so Ezra recognizes that. He says, verse 27, blessed be the Lord God of our fathers. He, he's, not, he's not praising Artaxerxes. He's praising God. God did that. Who put this in the king's heart to beautify the house of God. And he says in verse 28, so I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. He recognized this, this is not man, this is God. And you know that too, right? When you experience God opening up a door, you recognize, I hope you do, you better recognize or God won't do that again. You wanna give glory to God, say thank you, Lord, that was you, that was you. So I gathered the leading men of Israel to go up with me. Now, who are those men? Well, that's chapter eight. These are the heads of the father's houses, the genealogy of those who came up with me from Babylon. And so all these uh, families are listed here. Actually, from verses 12 to 14, I'm not going to name all their names. I will definitely butcher them. Um, but if you add up the names of all the families that came, it gives a number. It's really just under 2,000 people. So whereas in the first... Um, wave of people back to Jerusalem were about 50,000. The second is only 2,000. Now, with this small group of people, he says in verse 15, I gathered by the river that flows from Ahava. It's right over there in, in Persia. And we camped there three days. And then I looked among the people, and, and we didn't have any Levites. So he's taking an inventory of the people. And he says, wait a second. We're going to need some more people to help with the temple. And only the Levites can do that. So he sends a delegation back into town to the Jews that are there to say, hey, would some of you come and help? And uh, in verses 18 through 20, we see that some did. There was 38 that came. You know, that's great. But overall, that's not a lot. In fact, you might be thinking, wow, only less than 2,000 came. It was a lot much better with the first departure. They had 50,000. But I just want to remind you that all of that together is still not very many. There were actually about a million Jews dwelling in Babylon at this time. And yet the majority of them said, no, we, they had a free pass to go back to Jerusalem with the old man. And they said, no, we don't want to. We, we don't want to do that. Why? Well, because they got comfortable where they were at. They got chained to the comfortable. They got glued to the guaranteed, right? I don't want to give up this nice plush house and everything I have to go out and who knows what we'll get, right? 
And they, they forsook the blessing that would be in the land of God, in the very house of God. And you know, this can happen to us, right? We can get comfortable with our living, comfortable with the things that we do all the time, and, and we don't want to take a chance, or I don't know if I want to step out and do this thing for God. What if? And, and you know what? That we just get too comfortable. We get in our comfort zones. We get in sometimes even in a Christian bubble, right? I've kind of said this before, but you know, sometimes we just hang out with only Christian friends. We go to our veterinarian who happens to be a Christian because our dogs are Christians, our pets are Christians, and we go to our Christian doctor, our Christian, we, right? Everything's Christian. And then you're living in this bubble. And I'm not saying we don't want to have fellowship with Christians and bless Christians. I get that. But we do want to look for opportunities and get out of our comfort zone for the world. Listen, we're, man, we're, we're, a, we're a small minority. We're a small minority. And we need to, my wife and I are praying all the time, how can we, how can we reach people that don't know Jesus? And I'm kind of trapped in a Christian bubble being a pastor. And uh, that can be a little frustrating, that in itself. So we look for opportunities where we can rub shoulders with the world to share Jesus with them. So, and here's the thing, we can get so comfortable in that, and then we don't even serve. We, we, get, we get to be these uh, obese Christians, you know, that we just sit in a chair or a pew and just take it all in, man. Bring it to me. Right? I mean, that's true. We can be that way, so, but we want to serve. We want to get involved. We want to be in, the, in what God is doing, man. Get in the flow. There's nothing more exciting than that. So I want to, man, if there's anything I do, I hope that would pump you up. I want here to pump you up tonight to get you pumped for Jesus. I mean, I really would love to see that happen, to serve him. Really, get excited about following the Lord. All right, so um, just a few people were coming back, but he did get some Levites. About 2,000 are going, and I proclaimed a fast in verse 21 while I was there by the river that we would humble ourselves and we ask God, notice, for the right way for us and our little ones and all of our possessions. We were praying God and seeking God before we took off. Why? Here's why. Because I was ashamed prior to our departure to request of the king, that's Artaxerxes, an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road. Because I had spoken to the king, because I told the king, I serve the living God, right? And the hand of God is upon all those who seek the good of him but his power and wrath are against those who forsake him. So Ezra says, we need to pray because I told the king, because the king had probably offered him. Now, hey, listen, I'm sending you with all this money and everything, and I'd like to give you an escort, some guards that will protect you all the way, 900 miles to Jerusalem. And, and Ezra said, we don't need that. We serve the living God. We're not fearful of anything. Now think about that. Isn't that crazy if you're Ezra? That doesn't make any sense. He's going with less than 2,000 people. None of them are soldiers. None of them have weapons that we know of. And not only that, they're loaded down with silver and gold. And they're going 900 miles and they're traveling lands where there's going to be, you know, robbers and all that kind of stuff going on. And Ezra says, no, we don't need any protection. And then he goes, man, we better pray. Oh, Lord. Right. But I, I, but I do. Don't you love his spirit? That I think this is how God wants us to be. God doesn't want us living in fear. People, so many people live in fear for so many things. And uh, I'm not fearful. When it's my time to go be with Jesus, I'm going to be with Jesus. And when it's not my time, I'm not going to go. Of course, I'm always worried about, what if I'm on the plane and it's his time to go? I, <laughs> how does that work out? I, I figure God will protect me, right? But... Think about that, that when you live in that place of no fear, man, it's, it's, uh, it's freeing just to serve the Lord. So we fasted, verse 23, and we entreated God uh, for this, that, and, and he answered our prayer. We're going to see that God was faithful to that. Now, in verses 24 and 30, he divides all the silver and gold amongst all the people. So, you know, it was divided up among everyone else in order to carry the load. And in verse 31, we departed on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of God was on us. And he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from the ambush along the road. God was faithful. Again, this whole passage says faithful. God is faithful. Listen, God will protect you. God will be with you. And if God allows you to go through a trial or a difficulty in your life, whatever you might be fearful of, then God has allowed that. And he's wanting you to learn to trust him in that place of uncertainty. And we all have that in our life. That happens. But, you know, he's going to be with you. 
So we came to Jerusalem, we stayed there three days. So they arrive and they just kind of chillax. Then maybe they made their tents on the outside of the city. Again, there's no walls at this time or anything like that. And now on the fourth day, verses 33 and 34, they weighed out all the silver and the gold that had been given, and they gave it to those who were in charge of the temple treasure, and everything was accounted for. So they've made this long journey. It took months to get there. Everything's arrived. They've arrived safely. And, and so, you know, what did they do? <laughs> what we do, thank the Lord. In verse 35, what they do is they offer up burnt offerings to God. All these sacrifices, this, is, this was their way of praise to God. We're going to offer up all these animals, sacrifice, say, God, you are the God who saw us through. And, and we just give everything to you. Thank you so much. And, and they delivered also, verse 36, the king's orders to the king's satraps and governors beyond the river. So as soon as they had this letter now, King Artaxerxes, they delivered it to the, the people in charge in the area. Said, check this out. Read this letter, you know. It tells you you have to leave us alone and you have to not tax us and you have to provide anything we need. <laughs> At the end of verse 36, it says, so they gave the support to the people in the house of God. Isn't that awesome? So man, everything seems to be going quite well. Now we come to chapter nine. When these things were done, the leaders came to me. So the leaders now, the, that's the Jewish leaders. They come to Ezra and say, we're glad you're here, but we got to tell you something. The people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, um, <clears throat> we haven't separated ourselves from the people of the land. Um, we've, we've been messing around with the people here, the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Chebusites, Egyptians, Amorites. Well, what do you mean? Well, we've taken their daughters as our wives, and we've had children by them, and uh, we've intermarried, and uh, we've committed this heinous trespass. So here's this horrible declaration. The one thing, this, listen, this was the reason why God drove them out of the land to begin with. When he brought them into the promised land, he says, wipe them all out. Do not intermarry with them. They did it. And they did it over year after year after year. And finally, they were worshiping all kinds of gods in Jerusalem, all the various kings. We saw that in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. We saw that. And here they are starting the process all over again. If you're Ezra, what are you going to do? What would you do if, 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 you know, have you ever had your kids, you've told them not to do something, they do it. You tell them not to do it, they do it again. You tell them not to do it. And they've done this like so many times. What do you want to do? You just want to smack your head and just, right? Look at, look at Ezra. When I heard this, I tore my garment and my robe. I just, just tore it. And I plucked out some of the hair on my head. And I pulled down my hair out of my beard. Can you imagine that? So, I mean, he, this guy is frustrated. And, and everybody got the point. Look at verse four. And everyone who trembled at the words of God of Israel assembled to me. They were like, oh boy, we really blew it, right? And they're, they're now approaching Ezra. We're so sorry, you know. Because they realized, it says in verse four, that we were carried away captives for this very thing. And so, verse 5, at evening sacrifice, I, I arose from my fasting, having torn my garment and my robe, and I fell to my knees, and I just spread out my hands to God. Oh, God, you know. He says, verse 6, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift my face to you. Our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. Our, our guilt has gone up to heaven, you know. So Ezra is broken. He goes, I, he's representing the people. He doesn't see himself as, you know, clean and separate from them. He says, no, we've blown it. I, I love the fact he associates himself with the people. We've blown it. And he goes on to pray in verses 7 through 15, just recounting the fact that we were slaves in Persia because we did this. And here we are doing the same thing, you know. Look at verse 9. He says, we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in bondage. He extended mercy to us to revive us, to bring us back, to repair the house of God, to rebuild the ruins. And now, O oh God, verse 10, what shall we say after this? We've forsaken your commandments. Verse 14, should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there's none of us left? God, would you not be right in wiping us out? That's what he's saying. And the answer is yes. And so he says in verse 15, O oh Lord God of Israel, you're righteous. Here we are left as a remnant, as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. We just stand guilty, God. Forgive us, you know. 
So chapter 10, as Ezra is praying, and of course here we come to the close of the book, while he's confessing, while he's weeping, while he's bowing down before the house of God, a large assembly of people come to him, men, women, and children, and they're now weeping as well. And uh, Shechaniah, he was one of the leaders, and he had committed this sin, by the way, as well. He speaks to Ezra and says, we, we've trespassed before God. We've taken pagan wives from the people of the land. Yet now, there is hope in Israel in spite of this. Really? How could there be hope? He says, uh, let's make a covenant with God to put away all the wives and those born to them according to the advice that is given. Let it be done according to the law. So Ezra, what we need to do is we need to make it right. We need to, we need to separate ourselves from the people of the land. And then they say to Ezra, interesting, arise, for this matter is your responsibility, Ezra. In other words, Ezra, we're going to do this, and we're going to hold you responsible to hold us accountable. We also are with you. Be of good courage and do it. I, and I love this. What they're saying is we're guilty, and we recognize you as God's man, and we're, at, we're putting ourselves underneath you, and we're asking you to hold us accountability to do what is right. Man, I love that. You don't see that very often, I'll tell you that. Because a lot of people think, man, I love God's word, man. It's so good when, it, when, it, you know, when we agree with it. <laughs> but when God's word kind of steps on our toes, we don't like the person delivering it. And we certainly don't want any, to be under anybody that's going to hold us accountable to it. Now, we should, and many times we have, but a lot of people don't. And I, I love the response of the people. Ezra, hold us accountable to this. And so they said, we'll separate ourselves from these people. So Ezra rose, verse 5, and made the leaders, the priests, the Levites, and all Israel swear an oath according to this word. And then Ezra rose up from before the house of God. He went into the chamber. He had no bread or water to drink, mourning because of the guilt. And verse 7, they issued a proclamation throughout the entire land that every, everyone in, that has come back from the captivity must gather in the square at Jerusalem. And that whoever, verse 8, did not come within three days according to the instructions, their property would be confiscated and they themselves would be thrown out. So this is a pretty radical decree. He says, you want to be accountable? Okay, I want every single person who's come back to the land to show up here. That would have been a lot of people. And we read verse 9, so all the men of Judah and Benjamin, they all gathered within that three days. It was the ninth month on the 20th of the day. They sat in the open square trembling because of this, and because it was also heavy rain. This is the ninth month, so this is the rainy season over Israel, so it's raining, it's cold. And Ezra the priest stands up before them and says, you've transgressed, you've taken pagan wives, you've brought guilt upon us. Make confession, verse 11, to the Lord to do his will. Separate yourselves from the people of the land so you know what needs to be done. But this, of course, you might already be thinking, this does bring up a dilemma. Because Malachi 2.6, it says, God says, I hate divorce, right? And as we come to the scriptures, we know in the, two Testament, in the New Testament, there are only two allowances for divorce. Adultery, as Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, and in 1 Corinthians 7, when an unbeliever departs, we would call abandonment. But neither one of these meet that criteria. And yet... God allows that to take place in this passage. Why is that? It's, well, we do believe it's because, listen, had they allowed themselves to remain as they were, idolatry would have prevailed and God would have wiped them out again. And of course, there's no then king coming there. There's no Messiah coming. The nation must be established and maintained again. And for that reason, God says, no, we're going to cut it off as soon as it begins. And so God was behind this to divide, to separate. And so all the assembly, verse 12, gathered and said with a loud voice, yes, you have said. And so we must do. We will do it and we must do it. And so by the first day of the first month, they finished questioning all the men. Now, again, they started this at the ninth month. So it took about three months. What, what took so long? Well, after the people gathered in the square, uh, Ezra and the leaders actually interviewed every single family, every one. And they questioned those who had taken pagan wives and so forth, as it talks about in verse 7. And so in verses 18 through 22, you have the priests. So the priests themselves had done this. In verses 23 and 24, you have the name of the Levites who had done this. 
And then verses 25 to 43, all the rest of the people who had done it. And their names are mentioned, yikes, right? Now, verse 44, all these people had taken pagan wives. Some of them even had children, of course, which complicated matters. By the way, can I say this? 13 years from now, when Nehemiah comes back, they go at it again. Can you imagine that? And, and Nehemiah, so here you have Ezra pulling out his own hair and beard. When Nehemiah comes, we're going to see, he actually starts tearing out the hair and the hair from the beards of the people. He, he takes it up a notch. He goes, yeah, I can't even believe it. Anyway, we'll, we'll see that when we get there. But here, you know, just the fact that I'm telling you ahead of time, which we'll see that they, they go back to doing this later, is that, you know, here there was reform. And, and leaders can help reform a nation's conduct as they do here. But only God can change a human heart. And only God can change a human heart if the recipient is willing, right? So I always like to say this, reforms are good, but what's really needed is revival, <laughs> revival. So here we come to the end of the book of Ezra. Now it ends kind of somewhat on a sad note. On the other hand, the people did repent. They did get right with God. And they did seek to do the right thing. And of course, years later, uh, Nehemiah will come. They'll build the wall. And of course, it's established again. But again, this book, to me, is all about the faithfulness of God. Again, we called it homecoming. The people are coming back. But it really speaks of God. Yes, he brought them back home. But it was God who did it. He is faithful. He told the people, I will bring you back into the land. Though you're rebellious, though you're stiff-necked, I'll bring you back. Though you'll blow it here, I'll still bring you back. I'll still work with you. And that's amazing. And I'm thankful for God that he is faithful to do that. And again, I just want to take it to your life. He's faithful to take care of you. He really will take care of you. Whatever your need is. Um, my wife and I have had the privilege, you know, during this time of shut-in to pray for a lot of people. You know, that's kind of been one of the things we focused on a lot, you know, because you're not interacting with people. People contact us and, or we pray for people. We've seen some real miraculous things happen in seeing God's faithfulness for people. We've had people during this time of shut-in when people are losing their jobs, have people come and say, I, have, I need work. And we've prayed for people and they got a job. That, that's been amazing. We had one lady come and she had, had a heart attack. She was going in to have open heart surgery. They said, you know what? You don't need to do that. You can go home. We prayed for her. I was like, well, praise the Lord. That was awesome. We had another person that had a, a cyst on their kidney, went in to just to have, the, have it removed and they did one more x-ray before the surgery. Said, oh, it's not there. We don't need to do it. We had another person that came to us and said, you know what? I've, I had my leg amputated about a year ago and I've been, would you just pray it? We've been fighting with the insurance company to get a, 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 you know, a prosthetic leg. We prayed. Next day they called. Guess what? The insurance company called us today and said, I'm like, what? We have seen God do so many amazing things. And, and that, what that says to me is like, God is faithful. God is just so faithful. I, I, I'll close with the words of J. Hudson Taylor. If you've never read his biography, and there are several on him, he was the famous missionary to inland China. And J. Hudson Taylor said this, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. It's such a good word. And that's not just for missionaries, it's for us in our everyday life. And why is that true? Because God is faithful. Amen. Let's pray.